Are you looking for an antidote to information overload? Well, at a time when the news cycle is moving faster than ever, the week is here to help. Our new digital subscription includes a twice-daily digest of the most interesting, important stories of the day, along with the liveliest comment and analysis. Open your app or inbox, and in just a few minutes, you'll be up to date and ready to face the world. And you'll get digital access to The Week magazine too. Sign up now for a 10% discount, plus your first six weeks free. Find out more at theweek.com slash winter24. That's theweek.com slash winter24. Can Do is more than just an attitude. Can Do is navigating today for a brighter tomorrow. It's the expertise to try to minimize risk while maximizing opportunities. Can Do is being right here for you through every eventuality. Can Do is Can Accord Genuity Wealth Management. Visit CanDoWealth.com to see how we can help you build your wealth with confidence. Investment involves risk and you may not get back what you invest. It's not suitable for everyone. It's the week ending Saturday the 17th of February and this is The Week Unwrapped. In the past seven days, we've seen a mass shooting in Kansas City at the Super Bowl Victory Parade, Labour suspending its support for two parliamentary candidates over comments about Israel and the death of radio legend Steve Wright at the age of 69. You can read all you need to know about everything that matters in The Week magazine, but we're here to bring you some stories that passed under the radar this week. Big news, not making headlines right now, but with repercussions for all our lives. I'm Ollie Mann, and let's unwrap the week. And joining me today from the week's digital team, it's Rebecca Evans and Jamie Timpson, and we welcome back science and climate journalist Jessica Hullinger. Uh, it was pancake day this week, guys. Did any of you partake? Yes. Yes, I did indeed. Homemade or shop bought? Oh, it's got to be homemade every single time. How many did you get through before you hit a successful pancake, Rebecca? You know what? It wasn't too bad. Um, I was assisted by my family this time around. But um, (laughs) yeah, yeah. (laughs) I can't flip pancakes to save my life. But they ended up being very nice, you know, traditional uh, golden syrup. And I had some vanilla ice cream with mine, which was lovely. Mm -hmm. That's obviously not breakfast then. But well done for getting some professional support. Uh, Jess, as the American, I guess you don't do pancake day, do you? You just eat sweet things constantly. (laughs) Yeah, well, yes, that is correct. But we did pancake day in my household. My children wouldn't forgive me if we if we didn't. But I went to the shop and got some uh, very expensive American pancake mix. So we did the fluffy pancakes with traditional maple syrup and made it a proper American breakfast. Whereas imagine, Jamie, for you in Glasgow, American pancakes, not the done thing. No, I actually think that's quite heinous. (laughs) <laughs> on uh, on pancake is sacrilegious. It's my and... job to be the American on this show who's very heinous. Yeah, yeah. We don't actually cook our pancakes. We just have the batter <laughs> r- raw <laughs> up here. Uh, well, on that, Jessica, it's over to you to kick us off. What do you think this week should be remembered for? Ocean currents run amok. The Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, or AMOC, is a large system of ocean currents that acts like a conveyor belt carrying warm water from the tropics into the North Atlantic. How does this work? As the water travels to the north, it becomes colder and saltier. The more salt you have in water, the heavier it is, causing it to sink and move back south. And as the conveyor belt makes this loop, it does a lot of cool stuff, like delivering nutrients, regulating temperatures and sea levels in the Northern Hemisphere, and plays a huge role in global weather patterns. A video posted on Tuesday by climate science channel Pattern, I assume that's how you say it, they haven't provided a vowel, uh, explaining the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. I really don't know how to say that. I know the abbreviation though, AMOC, Jess, why is Mm -hmm. AMOC in the news this week? Right, so uh, on Thursday, Irish Senator Malcolm Byrne brought an issue to the floor of the Senate of Ireland um, about AMOC, and he basically was referencing a new study that came out at the end of last week showing that this essential ocean current system is nearing a tipping point uh, towards collapsing. Um, And he wanted to raise this in front of his fellow lawmakers, um, talking about what the potential ramifications could be for Ireland, which are bad, and um, also to talk about what we could do to prepare essentially. Okay, so let's take us right right back to basics. So what mm. is AMOC? I know I've tried yeah. my best to say it, but what is it? So AMOC is a network of deep and near ocean current systems, right? So it's the way that the Atlantic Ocean moves from north to south. And what it does is it takes warm water from the equator and it moves it north 
right up to the coast of Greenland where it cools. And when the water cools, it becomes more salty and more dense and it sinks to the bottom. And as it sinks to the bottom, it pushes all the water out of its way and that water moves, it serves as a sort of like engine, it moves the water back down to the south, to the equator, where it moves up to the surface again, and the whole system starts again. And when you look at this on a, on a global map, it looks like a sort of like, like a, you could see it moving from north to south, and it moves warm water north and cold water back down to the south. So what the system does is it controls like weather systems um, in various parts of the world. It controls um, sea level, and there's serious concern that um, climate change and global warming is slowing down and could potentially stop this system, which would have um, quite scary ramifications. Okay, slowing down. So what kind of timescale are we talking about? And what could those ramifications be? So your first question is the, is the one that everybody wants an answer to, and it's very tricky to answer that question. We know that EMIC has been slowing down already. There's one uh, study that has shown that it has already weakened by 15% over, uh, since the 1950s. So we know that it is slowing down. What we don't know and what the scientific community cannot answer right now is when, that will, when it will actually stop. What this new study has done, though, is it has provided and it has used a very complex modeling system to basically demonstrate that there is a tipping point, right? So there's been speculation for a long time that um, because global warming is dumping loads of fresh water into the ocean, it is diluting the saltiness of the water, therefore the water stops moving and, and halting the process, right? But this is one of the first studies to show that um, at a certain point, that actually does trigger a tipping point. Um, so we know the trigger, the tipping point exists. We don't know when it will be hit sort of depends on us, right? It depends on how, over the next few decades, how much we emit, how how warm the globe gets. And it's, a, it's really complicated. It's very difficult to predict when it will actually happen. However, these researchers have, have demonstrated what they call a warning signal, right? So they have measured the amount of fresh water that's being released in a certain area of the system. And they say that that shows that the system is weakening and getting weaker. Um, and they put the time frame, uh, they say, it's quite vague, but they say it could occur around mid-century under the current scenarios of future emissions. And that's where this story is different, isn't it, Rebecca? Because usually when people are talking about those slightly more nefarious or in-depth kind of concepts when it comes to climate change, you know, not just a general sort of we're emitting things and it's causing a problem, but there is a particular stream of water you should know about and this is why, people haven't come up with apocalyptic scenarios quite so close as that. That's what struck me reading through this. This is talking about in my children's lifetime. No, it's incredibly uh, worrying in, in that sense. I mean, um, an abrupt shift in this AMOC hasn't happened for more than 10,000 years. So it would be very unprecedented if it were to occur. Now, the last time it happened was during the most recent ice age. So if we're making comparisons there, it's rather frightening to think that the day after tomorrow, the film could actually probably come true in, in, in some level, perhaps not as dramatic or perhaps as dramatic as, as it happens in the film. Because And for those of us that haven't seen it, what's, what happens in the film? Lots of freezing cold temperatures and ice and uh, Europe freezing over, um, stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, lots of extreme weather um, occurring. Yeah, well, Jamie, Glasgow, but colder. Mm, it's not possible. <laughs> Hard to it's imagine. Not, it's not It's not possible. Um, I mean, the example that the study gives uh, is that Western Europe would start to cool down by as much as three degrees Celsius every decade. Sea levels, like uh, Rebecca mentions, would surge by up to a metre as water piled up in the region. Also, the bottom of the ocean would run short on oxygen, which would kill all the creatures that live in its depths. Um Obviously, this is all happening concurrently, or it potentially will happen, concurrently with the world getting warmer thanks to humanity's kind of heat-trapping greenhouse gas pollution. Um, I would say that this was one of those stories that I was certainly like less happy after I'd read about it. Um, and it definitely does seem, while they can't decide when it could happen... There is, a, from what I've read, a strong feeling that it could be, like you say, within our children's lifetime. I'm quite young, so maybe potentially even my lifetime. Um, and that is a, obviously a big worry. And, and I was going to ask Jess, what can we do? 
what can we do about this? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. The, I mean, the, the, the easy answer is, well, we stop emitting, right? That's, that's the easy answer. And that's that when I was researching this and I asked the same question, that's the, that's the answer that was at the top of all the sort of um, suggestions. But I think if we're realistic about how things are going, I think the, the real answer is that we have to start thinking critically about how, how we survive in a world where the agriculture system changes dramatically, right? There was one statistic I read that said that as much as half of the world's viable area for growing corn and wheat could dry out mm. if this happens, right? So we'll see huge shifts in the way that the world feeds itself. Um, so we need to start thinking about that now. Um, and we need to start also thinking about what it would mean for our homes if, if it gets very, very cold here. What does, that, what does that mean for the way that we live? I mean, it's going to change everything, transportation, uh, health care. It's going to change everything. So I think by bring, actually by bringing this to the floor of the Irish Senate and, and raising the sort of political awareness of this and saying, actually, this is real. And what are we going to do to prepare for this? I think we'll probably start to see more conversations about that as we go forward. Or will we, Rebecca? Because, you know, we've already seen in the last uh, 10 days or so Labour U-turning on their Green Pledge. Um, you know, we have a general election uh, this year. And in the presidential election in America, these issues don't really seem to be being discussed. There is a, um, there's a, a difference of opinion between Republicans and Democrats about what they do. But neither of them are proposing a solution to this. Look, I think it's it generally it's it's far too easy to kind of dismiss environmental issues because we we view it as a kind of abstract concept as something that will happen in the future and we won't necessarily have to worry about it, which is why I think studies like this are so important. I mean, Jess has touched upon the idea of agriculture, which is obviously huge and important across the globe. And someone who uh, who authored a similar study last year, Peter Ditlefson, said that a collapse of AMOC could be a going out of business scenario for European agriculture. It's not only going to f affect agriculture, it will affect weather, it will affect just the way that we live our lives in general. So I think there does need to be um, more high level change in, in policy and foregrounding the environment as, as this urgently important issue. And it's something that we can all come together on and we all should come together on, particularly as it will affect us, children, grandchildren, generations to come, really. So... But not every nation has the money to help out when you're talking about all coming together, Jamie. No, and I, I think, you know, as we saw from the most recent COP, when there was a lot of uproar about some of the smaller island nations being locked out of some of the discussions and not being involved in, in some of the discussions, some of the smaller island nations that are the, are the poorest and also have the most to lose by rising sea levels and things like that. What we have seen is that, you know, money talks and particularly if if we keep seeing some of the levels of production of coal which china i mean china had something like 96 percent of all of the world's coal production in terms of the creation of coal factories and stuff last year i think it does fall on the, the nations at the top with the, those with the, with the the kind of broadest shoulders whether they can be persuaded i'm not sure like you say about labor last week but also i, I think um the closer that we get to these kind of culture war issues, things like ULES, things like that, I think it's it's going to be a lot harder to persuade people that they should, uh, what they would see as cutting off their nose or, or kind of hurting themselves for future generations. I think it probably will need films like The Day After Tomorrow or Don't Look Up to, to really highlight why it's important that we do need to, to listen to climate scientists. Jess? It's interesting that we're talking about our children and our lifetimes and looking forward. There was a study recently looking at um, ways that we could try to encourage people to care more about climate change, basically get them to engage more with the issue um, and to support policies that are climate friendly and, and, that, and that put the climate first. Um, and one of the most powerful ways, according to the study, was to encourage people to engage in what's known as generational thinking. And this is looking ahead towards the future, thinking about the people who will come after us. And they asked people in the study to write a letter to uh, a child who is, I don't know, five right now and who will be um, 30 when th a lot of the, I mean, a lot of this starts to go down, right? And to, to, to write about what, what you as the writer are doing right now to ensure a livable future for, for that generation. And really putting those people in your mind's eye 
um, seems to engage a part of you that makes you want to more support climate policy and makes it more real, really. So I think it's really important that we continue to talk about what this all means for future generations and continue to try and make it real right right now. Except, I guess, for politicians, Rebecca, they're, they're focused on the economy, they're focused on growth. And, you know, Labour's plan for growth through green policy was about borrowing money. I mean, the point is that a lot of green policy, if you do it, doesn't encourage growth. It means people lose their jobs and factories close down. And, you know, it'll take a long time to make up the revenue that you lose. And that's not the kind of thing that they want to be saying, you know, on a soapbox that they're going to deliver. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what Labour would would probably say as to the reason as to why they've scrapped this policy in the first place. I think they've recently referenced the fact that the, they, they argue the Tories have ruined the economy and therefore they can't afford that £28 billion package anymore. It's not exactly a necessarily a vote winner, is it, to say that we're going to, you know, mess up the economy for, for the for the sake of the, the environment to a certain extent as as Jess and Jamie correctly identify it is about the sacrifice now to uh, deliver that future for future generations um, and it's just whether people can get on board with that really it's as simple as that whether people can unite behind this idea and, and make it happen or, or not well I'm going to sacrifice this story for the benefit of your ears we're going to move on to something else after this can do is more than just an attitude can do is navigating today for a brighter tomorrow it's the expertise to try to minimize risk while maximizing opportunities can do is being right here for you through every eventuality can do is can accord genuity wealth management visit candowealth.com to see how we can help you build your wealth with confidence investment involves risk and you may not get back what you invest it's not suitable for everyone Jamie, your turn. What do you think this week should be remembered for? This week we found out why the latest Red Scare could be coming from your fridge. Officials warn China is looking to target critical infrastructure across the country. Now imagine that on a massive scale. Imagine not one pipeline, but many pipelines disrupted. Uh, Telecommunications going down so people can't use their cell phone. People start getting sick from polluted water. Trains get derailed, air traffic control system, port control systems are malfunctioning. This is truly an everything, everywhere, all at once scenario. Hacking America, a report from Scripps News posted to YouTube on Sunday. Uh, Jamie, what's been happening this week? Yeah, this week hacking's been back in the spotlight, I would say. Um, Microsoft on Wednesday, uh, who are uh, in collaboration, they've got a business partner, OpenAI, so they're now now basically working with ChatGPT, which we've discussed many times before. They announced that uh, generative artificial intelligence, so things like ChatGPT, are now being used by hackers, hackers from different states. They, They were saying chiefly Iran and North Korea, but also to Russia and China. Um, to basically improve uh, hackers' ability. They're using things like ChatGPT and and large language models to get better at hacking. Um, I mean, who could have possibly seen this coming, eh? Um, Using ChatGPT for for nefarious uses. But it it followed a very interesting discussion at a US committee hearing in which the FBI director um, told the, the hearing that Vault Typhoon was the defining threat of our generation. What's that? I knew you would ask. <laughs> Vault Typhoon is a is a Chinese hacking network um, that it turns out has been lying dormant inside U.S. critical infrastructure for at least the last five years. Um, the way it works is that it targets old pieces of tech in quite important parts of uh, U.S. infrastructure. So you're talking your old routers, your Wi-Fi networks, anything that really is uh, like um, connected to the internet printers potentially even fridges hence my my teaser earlier oh, i see but what's what the main issue is that these uh this hacking network vault typhoon have been laying dormant in these in these pieces of technology that the u.s believe and christopher ray who's the fbi di- director they think that it could well endanger the lives of Americans uh, through the disruption of pipelines severing of tele uh, telecommunications pollution of water facilities I mean, it incites societal panic and chaos. So it does so sound not because, bad. So if, if this virus is in my fridge, yes. it's, it's not that a Chinese hacker would turn off my fridge 
and deprive no. me of my fridge is that they'd use no. what the connectivity power of my yeah, fridge. Yeah, it's basically about so it's called um living off the land techniques and it basically exploits um ways into IT networks. So they'd use my fridge to get to my Wi-Fi network and from there yeah. they'd get security or uh, yeah and then and then they just get in basically and and often it's because vulnerabilities exist throughout everything that we use that connects to the internet. But most of the things that we update, we know to update. So our phone, our computer, um, our TV even. But what we're not doing is we're not updating the garage doors or the fridge. And therefore, once they're in as pretending to be your fridge or once they're in as part of one of the pieces of technology, the rest of the network thinks, oh, it's fine. It's just Ollie's fridge. I, I won't I won't like set, I won't flag this up because Ollie's fridge is telling me to, you know, do whatever. Invade Taiwan. Invade Taiwan. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, this is the thing, isn't it, Rebecca? I mean, what we're talking about Vault Typhoon like it's just uh, a series of ones and zeros, but there's there's people behind it with intentions. What are their intentions? Well, as we know, Western intelligence would say that uh, that, that Vault Typhoon is connected to China, uh, and as you can expect, China denies any of these um, accusations of cyber attacks linked to or, or backed by Beijing. But it's interesting that you mentioned Taiwan because I think. The Chinese state clearly has precedent when it comes to cyber espionage, especially when it when it comes to Taiwan and their desired invasion of Taiwan. Um, so I don't think necessarily we could put anything past the Chinese government in in that sense. And I think it is potentially a political power. It is potentially a really useful weapon for them to have in their arsenal with these cyber attacks. It, to me, the whole thing kind of reminds me of the idea of the possession of nuclear weapons. It's almost like mm. they're, they're kind of goading the West to say, we've got this technology. It's up to you if you want to test us and see how we're going to use it. So um, it, it will be interesting to see how that develops and, and, and how um, both both sides of the globe kind of use this as a potential, um, as a potential weapon going forward. Well, do you think every country is looking at it, Jess? Because we're talking a lot about military spend as well, aren't we, with regards to Russia, Ukraine and Israel, Gaza. But actually, you know, in the wars of the future, shutting down the technological infrastructure of a country so they can't access cloud computing is much more powerful as a way of disrupting everybody. Yeah, hugely. I think that's a really good point. Um, I, I think it's kind of nuts that we have allowed over the last 10 years the Internet of Things or these sort of smart devices to to be so deeply integrated with our critical infrastructure. I still can't wrap my head around how we've done that while at the same time not really regulating the policies and the, the rules that these companies that make these products have to have to abide by in order to put them out into the world, right? Like they are highly unregulated, which is just I don't know, it just seems like such a huge oversight. Um, but I think that's stor- sort of starting to change now that, that attacks like this continue to happen and that the world becomes a bit more aware of how uh, disruptive this could really be in terms of infrastructure attacks. Um, but there was a, at the end of December, the European Union agreed on a new cybersecurity law to basically secure the Internet of Things. And it meant that, like, if you make these products, you have to, like, hit a certain level of security checks and... Um, one piece of the puzzle that I found really interesting is that this new law means that you, um, y- if you're a manufacturer, you have to provide security updates throughout a product's lifetime, right? So one problem is that we have old products, or rather tech companies want us to um, buy more products so they stop updating them after a certain amount of time. Mm. Um, and that is a huge cybersecurity gap, right? And it makes you much more vulnerable, and so this rule says that if you are a manufacturer, you have to update this product basically as long as a user has it, um, which I think is is really interesting and quite... Um, I just can't believe that we haven't done that before. But also, I guess, Jamie, educating the public that updating the software on their items is a good thing to do. I mean, you know, I sort of sigh inwardly when my, my printer or... You know, my microwaves tells tells me to update software because I just think, well, it's working fine. I'm really not bothered. And so, you know, imagine how it felt for my grandmother when she was 95. You know, she didn't even understand what was being asked of her. There is a prompt. You have to give permission. Yeah, and I, I think, I, I mean, I, I, I feel like, you know, my dad used to be a, an IT 
consultant and one of his biggest pet peeves was just how how rarely people updated even though it's so easy the software update button is right there how few how many people did re- remind me tomorrow or or tell me later or whatever and it can have massive effects obviously on on you on your own personal finances even the thing about education is is so important and as we get closer and closer to you know whatever the future is with ai and chat gpt we will need to teach people about technology and there was an example last Last week that was um, quite amusing in that um, this Swiss news report um, that seemed to suggest that three million smart toothbrushes were rising up and being used in a, a denial of uh, service attack. Um, <laughs> it sounds like a South Park episode, rising yeah, up the toothbrushes. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> Jamie, I think you mean a denial of service a plaque. Oh, <laughs> that's good. Oh, that's good to jump stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, 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 so it got picked up because obviously it, it's a it's a mad story. Um, and even I was putting together the newsletter last week and I saw it and I saw that it had been picked up by ZDNet, which was like one of the, the, the tech websites or, or certainly one of the outlets that was there. And I started putting it together and then I just thought, even me, fairly limited of the knowledge on this account, was just like, this is mad. Like, this can't be true. And then it turns out that basically it was an illustration of what mm. could potentially happen in the future. Um, so, I, I mean, there, there was quite a good piece in Axios about how it even happens, how it goes viral, how people are duped by it. But basically, the thing that they said is like, when you're reading something that does seem deeply terrifying, ask questions about why would they do this? Like, why would they get the toothbrushes to, to, to rise up? Because all of the yeah, information... You could, you could in, ask the question, why would they put an internet connection in a toothbrush in the first place? In general, place? yeah. yeah. And, and that's the thing, Rebecca, isn't it? I mean, I used to be a technology columnist and I'd cover a lot of these product launches from a consumer point of view about 10 years ago. And that was just when this sort of Internet of Things technology was being put into stuff. And the argument that I would say in print to people who said, why would I need a toothbrush that's connected to the Internet is you don't. It's fine. Choose a normal toothbrush. And obviously, you can still do that. But that argument is becoming thinner, isn't it? Because it's no longer so much about consumer choice. Try getting a TV now that doesn't connect to Netflix. Who wants that? Yeah, I mean, exactly. All of these older products will probably be phased out to a certain extent or, you know, f- entirely in the future. But I, I watched this really interesting TED talk on the in- Internet of Things, and it was this ethical hacker talking about um, the use of a smart kettle. So you can f- flick this switch on your phone in the morning when you get out of bed. By the time you come downstairs, the kettle is um, the kettle is boiled. 30 seconds of your day. But this appliance is hackable and as as we mentioned earlier you know it could be a a gateway into your wi-fi just because you wanted to you know not flick a switch in your kettle go downstairs and flick a switch you can flick it on your phone is it really worth it like for all of those you know smart appliances to potentially have this risk of of your wi-fi being hacked I don't think so. I don't really get it personally. I, I don't think you're alone in that, actually. I think there's actually a growing awareness um, among uh, the, sort of the younger generations, people saying, I don't really want this in my home. Like, Alexa's kind of freaking me out. Or, you know, I, I had a problem with my Nest smart thermostat in my new home that was, like, disrupting my Wi-Fi. I had to disconnect it from the Wi-Fi because I couldn't connect to anything else. And I was like, why do, Why does this need to be... I don't need this to be connected. <laughs> this is ridiculous. Um but I think there was actually a, a survey recently from um, BlackBerry. I don't know if you guys remember BlackBerry. Um, they still are going concern. They're, apparently, they're still going. But wow. they, they've shown that younger people are much more worried about their smart devices. Um, and, and they're starting to be sort of wary of them. Whereas, like, boomers are sort of like, yeah, whatever, I don't care. Just install it, which, which kind of tracks, I suppose. But I do think that you're not alone, Rebecca. Um, I think that people are starting to sort of wake up to the question of, like, do we need everything to be connected? Too much Black Mirror, too much watching Black Mirror, freaking out, freaking people out. <laughs> Jamie, you get the last word on this. This is your story. Repercussions mm. for all the world. How serious are those repercussions? <laughs> it's always good to do a story like Jess's first because it really puts into perspective everything else. It's just like, <laughs> oh, well, you're all going to be underwater and everyone's going to yeah. die. So, <laughs> what, what difference does it make whether we're speaking Chinese or English? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like you're all going to drown anyway, so you might as well. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think what's interesting and also obviously we, we look at it through a lens of like Western media. This is there. And I mentioned it with the Red Scare thing earlier. I think there is obviously a bit of a panic around China and you can't ignore that element of um, what is kind of pseudo racism in lots of ways. Because I think that the, you know, the NSA, the CIA, GCHQ, 
we're all doing it too you know we if they if they're in our infrastructure for sure we're in mm. their infrastructure um uh, and it's very difficult to get your head around exactly what it will mean i think i think uh, you know if there is a war or, or whatever but i do think potentially you know the fact is is that they could do you know turning off the national grid would really would really mess us up and like getting into that level of intensity of attack and using stuff that i mean you only have to see when the like when the flight radar goes down or whatever happens and everyone just loses their mind at oh. Heathrow. Facebook like, goes down for five minutes, people get upset. Oh, don't yeah. They? yeah. I just, uh, yeah, I think it, um, it, it's definitely something to be worried about, but maybe get a bit more worried about AMOC first. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. That's a good point as well. Uh, I did make a couple of glib references to the Chinese, but you're absolutely right. I mean, the Americans and the British are going to be doing the same thing. They'd be stupid not to, wouldn't they, given the circumstances. Um, okay, Rebecca, you're up next after this. All right, Rebecca, what do you think this week should be remembered for? Trigger warnings in theatre. To be or not to be? Have audiences gone too soft? I think they have, yes. I think we didn't used to have trigger warnings. I mean, there are very disturbing scenes in Macbeth. There are mm-hmm. t- terrible murders and things. But I think the impact of theatre should be that you're shocked and you should be disturbed. I don't think you should be prepared for these things. And when I was young, I never, we never had trigger warnings and for shows. I so thought, would you get rid of them then? I, I would, yes, I would. I mean, I've, I think things like strobe effects and things that might affect people physically, they should be, um, they should be notified. Shakespeare's plays are full of murders and full of horror. And I'm, as a young uh, student and lover of the theatre, I never experienced trigger warnings telling me don't. By the way, in King Lear, Gloucester's going to have his eyes pulled out. <laughs> Ray Fine speaking to Laura Koonsberg on the BBC's Sunday with Laura Koonsberg on uh, Sunday. Uh, trigger warnings then, Rebecca, in the spotlight this week. Yes, yeah, so as you identify, um, Ray Fine's who is starring in a modern retelling of Macbeth that started this week, was interviewed by the BBC's Laura Koonsberg. During that interview, he suggested that uh, trigger warnings for theatre audiences should be scrapped. And instead of being warned about potentially sensitive themes, Fine suggests that audiences should be shocked and disturbed by the content that they're viewing. So I think this kind of leads to an important question about what we collectively believe audiences can handle and how theatre really addresses sensitive topics. Okay, and for those of us who don't visit the theatre regularly, I mean, I do, but if you're listening to this and you don't, what's the the kind of thing that these days you might expect to see written on the doors as you go into the venue? Sure, so I love theatre and I try to get to the theatre as much as possible, but um, the the type of things that you can expect to see is perhaps like a small billboard in in the theatre's foyer, which suggests uh, that there's some sensitive themes that are included, perhaps violence or... Uh, racism or there's a loud bang in in act two or something like that Uh, just notifying and and warning audiences of the kind of general themes or general things that they can expect to happen within um, a specific production is almost like a heads up really I mean it can feel faintly ridiculous Jess when people have spent a hundred pound a ticket to be there I mean, that's the thing. You know, it's one thing, isn't it? On a podcast, I've done it here on this podcast before. If we're going to be talking about a sensitive thing, sexual abuse or suicide or something, I will say, by the way, we're going to be discussing that next. Eating disorders is another one. You understand that because it doesn't cost anything to press pause. But you're at the theatre. You're going to see the show. You could have done your research in advance, couldn't you? No, I completely agree. I think that there probably is a time and a place for trigger warnings. Um... I think that if you're not expecting it, right, and and I I know that that's vague, but like if you so the, as is the case with this podcast, you come on, you, you listen to it, you don't know, you have no idea what we're going to talk about, right? And so it's very good at the beginning of the podcast that you say, hey, by the way, this might, uh, you know, this is going to happen. But I think if you're going to the theater, in theory, probably you know what this particular play is about. Ideally, you can do your own research and figure out, okay, hopefully you would know yourself well enough to know what your own triggers are. 
uh, and to know that maybe you should look into um, look into the contents of, of a play that you're paying quite a lot of money to go and see. So I, I completely agree with you. I do think that there are other places where trigger warnings are appropriate. For example, I still use Facebook, which makes me an old, but um, I use Facebook for like networking in like mom's groups. Um, and there is a really good habit that people have of putting at the top of a, of a post on a mom's group about like pregnancy loss or miscarriage mm. or whatever. Like if you want to talk about that or you need help um you put at the top like hey by the way this is a post that in- in- involves this particular topic it might not be what you're in this group for um and it might be quite triggering f- for anyone so please you know just skip over this post so i i think there's a time and a place i, I agree probably the theater is is uh, is too is not appropriate i suppose as well jamie there's just the thought that which i think is what fines was hinting at there if you go to the theater it's to be stimulated maybe it is to be triggered you know, if you've got personal experience of, of violent trauma and then you watch a violent trauma, your reaction to that being depicted is part of what makes the audience reaction that day. That's I, legitimate, you know. Yeah, I I feel quite strongly about this um, that I just do not understand what how trigger warnings bother people. Like, you can avoid it completely. It's one billboard before you walk into the audience. And if that means that someone is able to make a conscious, a better informed decision about whether or not this play is accessible or available to them, we're bringing together being like wokeness and being offended with actual physical responses, things like PTSD. I mean, I'll give an example. Um, my, uh, I, I met someone who was a Ukrainian refugee um, we were in uh, like outside and a plane goes over quite low. They have a full physical response to that. Like you see them like grip the chair. And I was shocked by that. Um, now, they might not know when they go into a into a theatre performance or anything, exactly every aspect of that play. They're not going to know that at like, you know, this point there's going to be a plane overhead, but it might completely ruin their day. Being offended is not the same as you know, intense emotional stress or intrusive thoughts or nightmares or suicidal ideation. It's like, how are we even having a debate about this? Because it's mad to me that a little billboard outside could ever affect my enjoyment of a play if it's going to help someone not have this emotional response or this physical response. He could speak about anything, right? Ralph Fiennes. He's on TV. He could speak about literally anything. And he chooses some facile argument about trigger warnings. Well, he, he was rather asked than... about that, to be fair. Yeah, yeah. But then just say, just say, oh, actually, I haven't really got an opinion on this. But what I do have an opinion on is how theatre, you know, we, we need absolutely more arts spending. We need better money into these places and theatres dying. Like, say all of that. Use your platform for something better than a boring, bo- like, debate about trigger warnings. Well, there are some trigger warnings that can't be avoided, Jamie. I mean, I think you make a good logical point when you're talking about just don't look at the billboard on the, on the wall. But, you know, suicide is a classic one. We've talked about it. It is sort of the responsible thing to do if you talk in detail about that now to give out the number for the Samaritans, to refer people to groups that can help them. And, you know, when you're talking about a TV broadcast, that is millions and millions of people that sit through that announcement. Is that necessary? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think it really, it really is. I, I think so. One of the examples that I found was that the Sun wrote a piece uh, deriding old Vic uh, bosses as woke for handing out a number for the Samaritans after Groundhog Day. Now I've seen Groundhog Day, and there is a lot about suicide in that in the musical, which is done for laughs, isn't it? Mostly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great. Pl- I would really recommend it. It's amazing. It's a really Can't amazing. See it. It's piece closed. Of- Gone. Mr. Opportunity. <laughs> um, but I, and the, this Sun article, you know, calls them woke, says that isn't this amazing that, they, that you're having to hand out Samaritans and, and mind information. And you just think like th- that, that is not I just there are so many other things to worry about in this in this world, worrying about whether or not someone has the, the you know, the ending of Groundhog Day ruined for them. Everyone knows how that ends anyway. I think one thing that sort of complicates this is the question of whether or not they actually work. Um, on anyone, right? So like the idea that you would give a a trigger warning and therefore it would help someone, um, which I think there's a lot of truth to that probably, but that there's not good science to back that up, right? So like there was an article in in The New Yorker fairly recently talking about how a lot of studies have been done on this showing that trigger warnings um, have no meaningful effect and that they can actually um, backfire and they can cause more distress 
on individuals than, than, they, than otherwise. There was one study that shows that it could prolong the distress of negative memories. Another shows that um, they reinforce the belief on the part of a trauma survivor that trauma is central to their identity. Um, so I, I'm not arguing really for or against, but I, I, I do as a science person have to fall back on like what research says about it um, and wonder if there could be any sort of downside to, to, to trigger warnings for people who do suffer trauma. But I also think like, it, it illustrates the societal question of like, how do we help people who have s experienced trauma, which is a lot of people and mm. growing in a society that is full of triggering traumatic things? Like what is our responsibility as, as good people who, who want to participate in culture and, um, you know, just be existing in the world? Um, how do we help people really in a real well, meaningful way beyond just posting a placard? So this is it, isn't it? And this is where it sort of maybe leans into what people think is virtue signalling, Rebecca, that there's an accepted argument around the kind of things Jamie's talking about, trauma, conflict, abuse, as we were saying earlier, suicide. But of course, you know, once you start listing everything that's in a production, especially as Ray Fiennes was suggesting there with Shakespeare, you know, racist attitudes, would you say, about the Merchant of Venice? You know, misogyny, would you say, about as you like it? At what point do you say people are grown-ups and they need to be able to contextualise things? Yeah, I mean, to a certain extent, I mean, as you mentioned, he's talking about plot spoilers in Shakespeare. And I just, I don't know whether that's just a disingenuous argument. I mean, most of us are going into Shakespeare kind of gen generally knowing what it's about, like trigger warning, expect poison in, in Romeo and Juliet. Like, I, I don't really know whether that's, whether the argument really holds up when it comes to Shakespeare in particular. But I just think oh, I, I there was really a trigger warning outside a production of Romeo and Juliet, which said this production includes scenes of underage intimacy. Is that an appropriate sure. trigger warning? Because it does. We all know it does. Sure. Why not? Like, I, I, I well, totally you've just agree. We all know it does. So that's why not. We, we, we all know it does. But if, if to me, our, our society, if we're truly being an, an inclusive and accepting society, we should understand that, OK, it might not affect the majority of us. But for those who it does affect, why not just provide some level of help? And I just think, uh, I think it's one of these things that will probably never be resolved as long as people don't see the nuances in the conversation. And as Jamie says, resort to words like woke and snowflake. I think we all want to be able to enjoy art, art and artistic expression for years to come. So yeah, it might be a bit annoying for the people that think, oh, I don't really need this. But for those who do need it, Sure, why not? Like, even if it's a billboard in the foyer or a QR code that you can scan on your phone if you're really that concerned about, you know, the spoiler effect of something. I just think it's it's necessary, really. It's necessary for the small minor minority of people who w will, will need that kind of um, content warning. OK, trigger warning coming up. I'm about to offer you a great deal on The Week magazine. Uh, my thanks to Jessica, Rebecca and Jamie. That's it uh, for this week. But remember, you can follow this show for free. You can get every episode as soon as it's released. Just search for The Week Unwrapped wherever you get your podcasts and tap follow. And you can also get six free issues of The Week magazine with a trial subscription when you go to theweek.co.uk slash subscribe. Uh, in the meantime, I've been Ollie Mann. Our music is by Tom Morby, the producer Ollie Peart at Rethink Audio. And until we meet again to unwrap next week, bye-bye. Are you looking for an antidote to information overload? Well, at a time when the news cycle is moving faster than ever, the week is here to help. Our new digital subscription includes a twice-daily digest of the most interesting important stories of the day, along with the liveliest comment and analysis. Open your app or inbox, and in just a few minutes, you'll be up to date and ready to face the world. And you'll get digital access to The Week magazine too. Sign up now for a 10% discount, plus your first six weeks free. Find out more at theweek.com slash winter24. That's theweek.com slash winter24.